Hello everyone, my name is Yawa Edi and you are listening to Better Than The Cure Preventing Intimate Partner Violence. This is a podcast that will feature a series of guests from different fields, sectors, all with knowledge and expertise on preventing intimate partner violence here within Alberta. For today's episode, we have Michael Hoyt here. Michael Hoyt is a municipal social worker from Edmonton who has worked extensively on educating men and boys to become better allies in the fight against intimate partner violence. Michael Hoyt here has also received multiple awards for his work from the government of Alberta's inspiration award to the queen's platinum award for the work that he's done and i'll let him take it away and tell us a little bit more about himself before he gets started with today's episode hi well thank you very much i'm a community building social worker with the city of edmonton and i'm situated on a, a specialized team called the family violence prevention team and our uh, our work is primarily uh, directed at uh, both uh, uh, providing supports to victims of violence and also working in primary prevention with the entire community to try and, and uh, uh, develop resources uh, citywide that would uh, uh, diminish, restrict, and uh, ultimately end uh, um, conflict in, in relationships, ideally. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. So we'll start today's episode or, or session, I guess, with men. <laughs> so when we talk about intimate partner violence, something that's kind of common you hear, it's really hard to get men on board, to get men talking about it. So I want to ask, what are the common misconceptions that prevent men from engaging the conversation with the fight against intimate partner violence? Sure. Well, there's a whole world of a uh, uh, socialization that men go through that uh, makes it difficult for them to engage. Mm-hmm. And, and although they're aware of the problem, and if you take the those obstacles away, they, they do want to talk about it. But men are socialized to be stoic. Mm-hmm. They're socialized to imagine that they have to assume positions of authority and, and control, make decisions. Uh, they're told they need to be tough. Uh, and those are expectations that are drilled in from a very young age with with men. So to overcome those barriers, or to back up a little bit, those are obstacles to being able to engage fully in a fully human way, Mm -hmm. I I would think, right? It makes a person, if you can imagine, almost robotic in in, in some sort of sense, following a script that says they need to be in control of themselves and the situation, and ultimately the people that they're invested or or, uh, 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 in relationship with. And would you say that that is the common gender role or common gender norms for boys specifically or men in Western countries or, you know, other other cultures as well? Well, it's certainly, uh, it's the paradigm in, in North America. Yeah. That, uh, but I, I, it's very easy to see that worldwide as well. Anywhere uh, we're organized in patriarchal sorts of ways in which men are taught to assume those roles of, a, mm-hmm. of authority. I don't think it's genetic. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that's where I'm coming from. I think these are socially prescribed roles. We've learned how to do them and, and uh, they do damage to... Uh, 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 to the men themselves and mm-hmm. to, to everybody that's around them as well. Mm-hmm. And we know these social norms have been built up over over centuries and many, many years. And we see this, our, our project specifically focused on African, Black, and Caribbean mm-hmm. populations. And we see in, in some of the cultural roles that men, like you expected, are supposed to be the authority. They're supposed mm-hmm. to, you know, be the ones in control, not show emotion. And sometimes a show of that control and authority can be misinterpreted as actions that are violent or mm-hmm. actions that are abusive or actions that, you know, are meant to justify the role that they're supposed to carry mm-hmm. out. So with all those years of building up those social norms of what a man should be, how 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 long do you think or what, what approach should be taken to break down those social uh, societal gender norms or notions, or is it even possible at the stage that we're at right now? You know, those are um, those are extreme views, and I, I want to back up a little bit and say there are sometimes those can be valuable uh, in in the proper situation. We want we want to have people with courage, right? Mm-hmm. And we want people who can stand up and, and not be knocked over by every uh, um, sort of wave that comes their way in lives and things like that. So those are those are actually valuable in, in some sense. It's when mm-hmm. they become your uh, uh, the ultimate. Uh, you know, the, the, that, that tight box that you have to try and live inside that I think they become uh, difficult. So your question was... Those, those social norms have, have been built up over the years of yeah. what a man should be yeah. in terms of, you know, everything we just mentioned. How long or is it possible at the stage we're at to break down those gender norms or to change them? Well, it yeah. is because we can have, men are interested in having conversations about making life better for themselves as well. And I think if you open up a conversation and say, what's it costing you? to try and hold up those norms as, mm-hmm. as well. I, I, is there any cost to you as well? Is that the kind of person you truly want to be? Yeah, mm-hmm. want to be. And, and they, they begin to have questions and, and uh, will take a position, mm-hmm. which is often contrary to that. You know, no, I'd like to have more uh, uh, close relationships. I, I'd like to have people engage with me because uh, out of love and, and, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and desire rather than out of fear mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, help me to have a look at what I'm doing in those situations that's precluding that from happening. Mm-hmm. Help me to... You know, to uh, 
to redefine the way I can have relationships. So men, given a safe place, and right. you know, a safe place is one in which they feel that they're not going to be uh, judged, uh, in which the, the conversations are being uh, supported in a, in a humble sort of a way where you know, everybody has a, a right to have a particular point of view and we can talk about it. We need to look at the consequences of our actions and then decide whether or not that's something that we, we stand for. Mm -hmm. And if we don't stand for that, what can we do to, to be different? And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, yes, of course, men will, will, will willingly engage in those conversations if you can create those safe spaces for them. And that's my next question for you because I love the fact that you mentioned safe spaces and I've, I've heard this term brave spaces as well um, and I think they're they're kind of similar oh, like with this, yeah the same intent <laughs> uh, how can we create these spaces for men to come in and have those conversations and yeah. have that dialogue that changes those gender norms yeah. or those expectations yeah we're at a wonderful time in, in, in doing this work right now because we recognize that uh, uh, men through that socialization that I was mentioning for the need to be stoic and the need to uh, uh, to be self-reliant and all those sorts of things uh, are not the sort of uh, teachings that would invite men to come into a classroom yeah. to, to learn. <laughs> so our learning now is to, uh, uh, we need to approach men in, in places where they naturally gather. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I think there we, we can have those sorts of conversations much more easily. Mm -hmm. You can prescribe a men to come to, to a, a program and they will come and, and uh, if you make it safe for them, they'll open up and warm and, and begin to talk about those things. But what about the opportunities that present themselves in, in the workspace that, that men inhabit on a daily basis or recreationally mm -hmm. or... Uh, um, in those cultural meeting places that right. men have after work and, 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 and uh, inviting some opportunities then to have some conversations about how your relationship is going and, and is that, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a man uh, today and, and what do you think of that standard? Is there anything that we, uh, we've learned from our past experiences that would allow us to uh, challenge that in some sorts of ways? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we can, have, we can create those spaces, but I think it works well with men to approach them in places where they like to gather and uh, right. really build on that. So kind of leveraging the spaces they already have from themselves rather than just building something, you know, out of scratch and hoping that they prescribe to it. Right. And yes, that's right. Yeah. Prescribing is, is not an easy thing for, yeah. for men to, <laughs> <laughs> to endorse. hundred percent. And I like the fact that you mm. mentioned earlier, those, those um, extremes of, you know, a man that a man that's an authority is going to be brutal and is going to be, you know, harmful. Um, but, also, those gender norms are sometimes needed in the fact that you want a man that's courageous or you want a, someone that's courageous in general and able to withstand. We want people that, yeah, that have those that are resilient, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, or maybe you can shed some light on this, do you think that people have that understanding that it's not one or the other where you know you're brutal and you know tough all the time, but you can be courageous and, and soft and still be, be the man that you're meant to be? Do you think that men have that understanding or... Maybe it's kind of like one or the other and they have to choose one. Well, this is the uh, the paradox, I think, that individually on their own, sitting at a chair, men are, are, are thinking about those things. I'm probably the only one in the world that kind of is critical of, of that <laughs> that man that man box description that I've mm -hmm. just given to you. But I, I think my neighbors buy into it. And that, that locks us in, though, right? If, if I'm the only person in the world that thinks I've got a different... Uh, uh, that I, I don't like this man box and I, I'd like to take on some of the role, but every other guy in the world seems to subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. It'd be dangerous just to drop your guard and say, hey, no, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to try and express my full humanity here and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, discover my emotional side and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and be vulnerable and, and, uh, and express that to people. Terrible challenge to have to try and overcome that when you think everybody else in the world is following the, pre yeah. the prescription, right? 100%. So, so in terms of that, how can we promote that, that um, mindset or how can we promote healthy, respectful relationships amongst men and boys, not just with each other, but with also females or people of the opposite genders? Because we know that these toxic relationships can manifest into intimate partner violence as you know, things develop. So starting from the root of it all, how can we promote more healthy um, attitudes towards um relationships between men and boys or men and women and boys and girls that kind of thing yeah so i, I think that i don't think there's a hard and true recipe yet mm -hmm. I, I, or, or maybe they'll never be right mm -hmm. uh, there are so many different uh, circumstances but we need to create those safe spaces a as we've talked about mm -hmm. i i think uh, that invite people to to be themselves and, and to disclose what they're really thinking without mm -hmm. without fear of being judged uh we need to have role models in those situations men that have uh, uh, taken some time to uh uh, challenge the box that they're living uh, live in and have stepped outside that and said, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to be part of that right now. I'm, I'm, I'd like to uh, explore new roles, challenge mm -hmm. myself to, uh, uh, to step away from that box and, and to be more, uh, uh, to be softer sometimes mm -hmm. and, and more understanding and to practice my, my listening skills. Mm -hmm. I, you know, those are important to me. And I'd like to invite other men to do that as well. So there are, 
Okay, so let's talk about the recipe first of all. So safe space, we've got men uh, right. now who are our mentors. We need to then inject some information there so people can see that there are alternative ways of being. This is a, uh, and looking across cultures is a wonderful way of doing it, right? Mm -hmm. There are uh, many, many different ways of expressing ourselves and inviting people to explore those and, and see that, my God, outside of my, my own personal experience, there's a world of other experiences that, mm -hmm. uh, that seem to be equally valid for other people. What am I learning from that? What mm -hmm. might I want to take on as an individual from what I'm learning there that uh, would be different than I maybe thought I could do before? Mm -hmm. uh, so in those safe spaces with mentors who are interested in facilitating those conversations, we inject some new possibilities, new ways of thinking, uh, and, and then we uh, uh, wait to see what happens. Mm -hmm. You create a crucible, right, where, where men do begin talking and, right. and say, my God, that's... I didn't realize that I could step out of the box. That's right. wonderful. I love what you've done there to, to step out of the box. How did you do yeah. that? Tell me a bit about the story of how you, you took a risk and, and uh, you know, did something to, to care for yourself or to care for somebody dear in your life. Mm -hmm. And I like that you mentioned it's kind of a three-step recipe, but again, with different cultures and different people of different backgrounds, you can kind of tailor it to what works best for you and your mm -hmm. community. But from what I'm understanding, the basis is you know that safe space. And we talked about leveraging those those places that men might already have, or these, you know, the recreational activities, the cultural gatherings, um, the mentors. So this is, you know, respected people maybe in the community or people that, you know, other men look up to or other men, you know, respect or um, revere. Um, and then the last piece is the information. So can this information, is it something specific? Is it something that can be changed? How do you determine what information would actually be valuable in, in that type of setting to kind of co complete the recipe? Yeah. Well, I, I think we have a good understanding of what a healthy relationship looks like, and, mm -hmm. and we can describe that for men. We can talk about some of the tripping you know, the stones for them, like the importance in, in healthy relationships of discussing consent. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk a bit about uh, uh, human rights and how do those get played out in, in, in all relationships. You know, mm -hmm. Human rights aren't just something that happened at, at the highest of levels, but yeah. they happen uh, intimately in, in, in gendered relationships as well. Everybody has rights, and, and sometimes those scripts that we try to follow... Uh, uh, impede the, uh, don't honor those rights mm -hmm. or uh, oppress uh, the expression of, of our human rights and engage people in those sorts of con conversations. So, yeah, I, I would add that to the recipe as well. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and I know most of your work is, is mainly preventative, right, in terms of uh, intimate partners. Intimate, intimate partner violence. So um, in your experience and the work that you've done, what, what do you think the main factors are that actually contribute to or cause men to perpetrate IPV to begin with? Uh, because if you know those factors, then you know what to look for and how to actually effectively prevent IPV. So I just wondered what what have the main factors been in your experience that cause men to? Oh, sure. I, I think it's it goes back to that socialization and those areas that we, we train men into and those areas that we don't allow men to exercise and practice. So, for example, uh, practicing the development of emotional intelligence is not something that we would necessarily prescribe to men when we're asking them to be stoic uh, mm -hmm. and... and uh, um, uh, tough and things like that, right? That's a, but it's important we have those discussions as well about men uh, or, or with men, you know, uh, about their emotional lives and, and helping them to recognize that they have them and that other people are also emotional beings and, and we need to acknowledge those. And, mm -hmm. and we have conversations about where people are coming from emotionally and that's safe and, and healthy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't do that often, often enough with men. I, I think once, I mean, if you look at young men uh, and I'm talking at the age of six, you know they're very playful and they're very emotive and and uh, right. uh, but by the time they reach ten, well, I don't know what grade that was, grade five or six, they've already got the the, the script very right. clearly in their mind. So something's happened in those that period of time that uh, socialized them away from being fully human mm -hmm. to just uh, expressing a one-dimensional aspect of themselves, which isn't isn't always. Uh, helpful right yeah, it's not, not nurturing it's not caring right so then do you think that's that's a crucial period of time for for young boys so we mentioned the recipe here and we're talking about men right but oh. we also need to factor in young so this boys. is a part of the recipe that i forget all the yeah. time and, and i tend to uh, engage with men that look more like me in terms of my age mm -hmm. and things like that and i notice in my work that there is a huge gap we are not reaching uh the youth mm -hmm. so uh, i thank you for bringing that up because that's a a terrible blind spot, I think, for all of us to fall mm -hmm. into. We don't uh, dedicate enough resources to uh, to our uh, our young men to help them to have those conversations right. at an age when they're just beginning to experiment with what do I, how do I want to be a guy? Right. What does it mean to be a guy? And and uh, what am I seeing around here for my examples? Mm -hmm. That's the time we should be engaging, mm -hmm. and we're not yet. Mm -hmm. So, 
when we have the recipe, you know, we're talking about, you know, older men, can can that recipe be, be replicated? And I'm using the term uh, recipe here very... <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, can that be replicated for, for young boys again, where, you know, use the safe space, you use the mentor, and then you use the information? Is that with those three things combined, can we expect, you know, the results that we're looking for uh, all across the board? I would think with youth probably even more successfully okay. than with older men, because yeah. as I said before, they're already curious and in a very right. open sort of way and exploring, whereas, you know, men at my age have sort of a, uh, even question whether it's okay to experiment or, or to look for alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. is, is it even safe to do that? So the youth are the key, I think. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And, and we talk about that that second ingredient where it's the mentors. Um, and I, I love the fact that, you know, before we were chatting about the, the program that you developed with fathers. So when we talk about mentors for young boys, how crucial is it that fathers or, you know, the, the active men in the lives of these young boys are actually involved in, in such a, a recipe yeah. or program? Well, of course, they're, they are the models, yeah. right? They, they are the examples that we look towards. So it's absolutely key that, uh, that, that uh, fathers demonstrate to their children, both men and uh, boys and girls, mm -hmm. right, to the, the sons and daughters, that uh, uh, um, the script, uh, men can be whatever they want to be, mm -hmm. as can women. And, right. and, and uh, fathers have an important role in, in, in uh, clarifying that for, for their children as well and, and setting up those uh, possibilities for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely crucial role. Oh, awesome, awesome. And in your experience, what are some success stories uh, of men or community members who have been um, actively engaged in intimate partner uh, violence prevention, and what can we learn from their, their experiences? Okay. W one example we have is, is somebody that I think we know in, in, in common uh, out of the Edmonton Mennonite Center, the Safe Families Program, has done some wonderful work there. And, and they did a, what I think of as an, as an experiment. I don't know how intentional it was <laughs> at that particular time, but uh, at one point they uh, were working with a uh, with a large immigrant uh, population, I think primarily Somalian at that time, and, and Nepalese. And they asked the women, what are some of the pressing social issues in the community that you think we need to address? And they took, they weren't, uh, they separated the women at that particular time and just had a, a, a conversation over, over coffee and, and tea and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And the woman explained to them some of the frustrations that they were have, having with uh, uh, parenting uh, in a new culture, right. with uh, you know, all the difficult uh, difficulties with economic uh, barriers and things like that. And then they took those problems to a group of men and said, here are some of the issues that have been identified by the women. How, how is men, what, what do you think we could do to solve those sorts of yeah. problems? Where, where might we go? And that created, a, set up a movement for allyship with, with mm. those men. So those men began to uh, recognize that those were well-identified, well-articulated problems that, that, that women were having and that men had a role in, in, right. in that as well. And, and they could carry on and, and, and work then step by step and step with the women, I think. That, that was a wonderful example, I, I think, of how we can create those opportunities. Um, when men have been informed I'll just go back uh, a number of years ago. The, uh, there were some dollars sent out to our post-secondary uh, institutions mm -hmm. to look at gender-based violence prevention work. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that discussion place took place with the men, in, in which they educated men about the uh, 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 gender-based violence and, and uh, the, the problems women face with uh, b being equal in, in, the, you know, in their communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the men were uh, absolutely on board with making changes. Those men came out of those post-secondary institutions having had that opportunity to, to discuss those uh, issues on campus and then to ask themselves, what, what can I do now that I'm away from the campus mm -hmm. to make a difference? And they began to find one another and, and develop some grassroots movements here in Edmonton. It was a wonderful, fertile time of uh, men coming forward saying, what are we gonna do to engage conversations, not just on our campuses, but everywhere where men work or, or socialize? Right. And, and I, was, I think that's a wonderful, uh, when those men who are key influencers recognize they have a role and, and, and could be starting those conversations in the community. They, they look for those opportunities. Yes. One example uh, was a, a group called Rad Dads who uh, uh, were becoming uh, young parents, young fathers. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, what uh, that group realized was that men weren't quite certain how to play with young children mm -hmm. even. And that educating men and how they can play uh, successfully and, in an engaging and way with kids, babies yeah. and, and things like that is, is a, is a a wonderful way to engage with men that men want to learn how, how they can do that they mm -hmm. don't have those sorts of skills they're not even sure if they could be you know uh, they don't want to break the young, you, the young women, child yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give, it to, give it to mom right she'll, yeah. she'll handle the, the diapers and things like that but when they were uh, engaged in, in thinking about ways of playing and, and things like that they just became alive and mm -hmm. that was started by young dads oh, that's awesome. themselves so uh, 
couple of great examples there yeah. and and i really like the fact um the post-secondary um example that you mentioned even the the example of um the group of somali men and women that kind of worked together and i think that's a great example of of allyship um but i find that do men need to be convinced of you know what benefit that they, that comes to them from being an ally mm-hmm. or what stake they actually have in being an ally because intimate partner violence um doesn't just affect you know women as mm-hmm. victims or I mean, I don't want to neglect the fact that men can also be victims of IPV here, but in the context that we're talking about, um, do men understand the the importance of allyship mm. and the stake that they actually have yeah. in the well-being of men, women, anyone that's experiencing intimate partner violence? Well, here's a challenge that I, I've experienced uh, at numerous times over my career is coming in and uh, recognizing that... Uh, we have an opportunity to engage with men and to invite them into allyship. Mm-hmm. This takes a lot of time to mm-hmm. do, and we're we're not a society uh, that's really comfortable with waiting and, and, and sowing seeds and, yeah. and, and seeing how change will come. So mm-hmm. we, we look for the quick solutions right. and not for the the obvious long term solutions that mm-hmm. require some investment of time and energy with no clear results mm-hmm. uh, or or at least not immediate results. So it, that's that's been the challenge I think is to uh, for example we need to. Uh, uh, when I've worked with uh, uh, African communities, I, I, I'm often puzzled by how the, why are we not talking about the oppression that the men themselves are facing? Mm-hmm. And then uh, questioning, you know, if that's not working for you, uh, oppression in that sense, where else is, are you seeing it in your lives? Mm-hmm. We might be able to address it. And it's so obvious, right? Mm-hmm. Well, in the gendered relationships as well. Mm-hmm. But we can take that learning from one situation and, and apply it to the second. Another, right. But you need to build relationship to do that. And, right. and uh, that's something that we often don't have time to. You mm-hmm. know, uh, programs are uh, time limited, uh, funding is, right. is uh, short, and, and uh, we, we try to apply these short-term solutions. And I'm, I'm not, well, I, I think we do need to have those, that short-term work, but we need to, as a community to say, no, I'm in this for the long run. Right. This is a, this is a generational yeah. sort of a <laughs> yeah. change, and I want to be part of that. But yeah. I might not see the ultimate work. I'm just a worker here. I'm not the master builder. <laughs> No, 100%. And I love the fact that you mentioned because a lot of times, you know, with programs, when you apply for funding and you set up your project, you know, there's a deadline to complete it by. But oftentimes you're not going to see the results or, you know, you're not going to be able to reap the benefits of the seed that you sowed until a long time afterward. So um, I guess in that in that sense, what what necessary investments are needed? You mentioned time, you mentioned energy, what other capital or what other resources are, are needed to make effective change? Um, and not just a quick fix or a quick solution because we know those don't last, to make lasting change uh, in this realm of intimate partner violence. Right. Well, you certainly need to have, uh, you need to have your role models and your, ed- your, your educators uh, mm-hmm. properly prepared and, and uh, to keep them renewed at, at all times. So that, that's a, an ongoing resource. But we need space. We, we need places that men feel comfortable in, whether mm-hmm. it's a soccer field, which uh, has been tried here in Edmonton to great success. You mm-hmm. know, this is a place where men can come after work. Uh, sit down, uh, uh, get involved in, in a game, and then have a conversation on the field afterwards. Mm. Just, uh, well, how's life going for you right now? And, and talk a bit about, did you know there's some resources in the community that uh, kind of address that issue you just brought up? And, mm-hmm. and educating people in that sense. Men are very open to, to hearing those things. That's a good time to do it. Mm-hmm. But uh, funding for a soccer field in Edmonton, uh, for those that are living in the cold, cold <laughs> climate, right? They know that we don't have soccer fields yeah. here in December through, well, up even earlier than that, November yeah. through, yeah. April or something like yeah. that, yeah. So we, we uh, where do we have, you know, we, we need funding for that mm-hmm. as well. So funding is a perennial problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, having the right people come in with a, a comfortable, safe space, mm-hmm. which also has to be physically safe. Right. And this climate is, is paramount. Right. And then you mentioned those educators um, and those role models. And I know for the young boys, we mentioned, you know, fathers, but for other men, um, we briefly talked about generally, these are other men that um, men respect or revere, mm-hmm. but who specifically speaking would those people be? Would it be people in the community that are kind of raised up and trained or mm-hmm. how can we create, um, you know, or make the, com- the community self-sufficient where these men can be kind of trained by the community and, and bring that benefit or that information back to the community. Well, here, add this to the recipe. I I think (laughs) we've had experience now. We we know that every community has got key connectors in it. These Mm -hmm. are people who seem to know everybody. They know what's going on. Those people play a key role because they can tell us who are the influencers Mm -hmm. in this community. Who do people go to when they have a problem related to a a relationship issue? Who do do they feel comfortable talking to? And then we need to get to those people Mm -hmm. and say, what can we do to support you in, in doing the work you're doing? Or how could you 
tell us more about how you've come to take on that particular role in, mm -hmm. in your life and, and to help us to, uh, to replicate that. Mm -hmm. So it's a process of uh, having to go out there and, and, and find these people and then the just... Engagement uh, with the community, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, awesome. And after you know, we implement this recipe mm -hmm. and we work with the men and the boys, how, how can we effectively measure the impact that it's made? How can, you know, we've, we talked about the long-term solution, but how, what metrics can we use to say, you know what, this worked, this yeah. gave us the result that we were looking for? I only have a couple of metrics, and I'm, I'm not a, a professional evaluator, but my metric is, uh, do men come back mm. to, the, to the conversation on a, re, on a repeated occurrence? Mm -hmm. When they do come back, do they seem excited to have those conversations? Are they, going, are, are they going into the community after those meetings and still talking in the parking lot? Are they really animated and energized by these conversations? Do they come back and tell you they're making a difference in their lives? Do they bring other men with them when they mm -hmm. come? Those are indicators for me, I, I think, uh, and another, uh, or, or measurements. Uh, and another measure would be uh, just what do the women say? Right. The men that are attending these uh, events, do they come back and say, my gosh, this is his uh, going to be human class where he just comes back with a whole new uh, list of things he can do to make my life miserable. What's going on there? Right? That's a very important indicator. So I think uh, uh, those are the, that's the barometer or thermometer I would use to gauge whether we're successful. Awesome. And just before we wrap here, up here in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, I like the fact that you, you mentioned women here because we, we've been exclusively talking about men, but we know that um, this talk or this discussion about intimate partner violence is not, you know, men do this, women do this, and we come back together. So how can men actually work with women? Or how can, uh, you have that example of that, you know, the Somali community, which I think is a great example, but what further can be done to kind of increase the, the uh, integration of men and women as they talk and discuss IPV, especially yeah. sometimes it can be triggering where if men are the perpetrators and you have women who are victims or vice versa even, yeah. um, how can we increase that collaboration where it's, you know, two people or two genders working together for one common problem as yeah. opposed to... Of course, if, if the problem is, is raw, right, and, yeah. and people are really feeling hurt or, mm -hmm. or, or scared or, or injured as a result of domestic violence, it's not easy to... Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to necessarily bring them in the room because mm -hmm. that's re-traumatizing re mm -hmm. for them. Uh, Having said that, I, I think we, as a community, need to really work hard at, at trying to see domestic violence as a, as a problem in mm -hmm. itself. It's not the person that's the problem. Right. Right? It's not the man. It's not the, the uh, who's a perpetrator, the woman, the victim. We don't want to just describe the problem to those personal characteristics that they bring. It's a problem outside of the people, mm -hmm. and we need to take a position. Mm -hmm. you know, once people are separated from their problem, we can look at it and say, okay, well, I'm not family violence, but there is family violence in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a position to say that that's not mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm then we can begin to have a conversation around how we could step away from that. But mm -hmm. I think that's important to, uh, uh, to engage, you know, to come with that sort of an idea of not bl uh, blaming mm -hmm. and shaming, mm -hmm. uh, but having a more open conversation in which we're, we're talking about the problem itself and how we all can contribute to a solution because we, we all can. We, look all be, we can be part of the problem or we can be working towards the solution. Right. And I think to help people to see that they have that you know, that freedom to make those choices and uh, and that responsibility to make those choices, mm -hmm. then we can move forward. Amazing. Um, and my last question for you here is when we talk about prevention, um, which is kind of the whole the whole essence of this project. You know, I love the dialogue and the conversation, which is one piece. What other pieces or things can be put in place to prevent? So we have the safe spaces, we have the recipe, but what else is needed to prevent intimate partner violence or preventing a man or even a woman from you know, making that mistake or making those behaviors that yeah. contribute to intimate partner violence? You know, one thing I, I've had my eye on for a while, and I'm not the only one, there are others in the community, is just to recognize that uh, uh, when, it began, when it becomes obvious that there might be a problem, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the resources right now to be able to go to somebody and, and say, you know, uh, um, I think you're going down a bad path there right now. That's gonna have some significant consequences for you. Mm -hmm. And I think, it would be helpful for your family as well you know, right. for you to take a different uh, path. Right. Uh, we, don't have, we don't know how to st initiate those conversations easily. Uh, and the police would be a perfect example of this, who are often called out to respond to a, a domestic uh, um, conflict call. Uh, and there's nothing there that they can do for, there's no charges to be laid or anything like that, but it's quite clear there's a problem. Mm -hmm. They would love to have that opportunity or that ability to say, hey, there's a path you could follow here. I mm -hmm. can introduce you to uh, members on that path or, or helpers on that path who mm -hmm. could kind of walk with you. Would you like to, would you like to see mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And, and I th I, I, that's working with a voluntary, right? It's engaging with men who are voluntarily saying, yes, this is not the path I want to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to make a, a, a different choice, but I don't know where to go to get that information. I don't know who to talk to in my community. Mm -hmm. And I think we could do a lot better at helping to identify 
uh, navigate, I guess, to help men to uh, begin to navigate that path. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much, Michael. And my last question, I know I said last question, my last question for you is how can people uh, stay connected with you or keep up with the work that you're doing or all the pro projects and, and programming? Where can they find you? Yeah, well, I, during the 21st century, yeah. the, the obvious way is on, through the city website. Uh, if you go to the uh, City of Edmonton website and look at the Family awesome. Violence Prevention, uh, we're listed on, under there, and, and in my particular office uh, uh, can be found there quite easily. So you heard that, folks. If you'd like to connect with Michael Hoyt, you can head over to the City of Edmonton website, which is edmonton.ca. That's right. Edmonton.ca, yeah. and um, you'll be able to find his information there. And that is everything for today. Thank you so much for listening to Better Than the Cure, Preventing Intimate Partner Violence. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Michael. And I hope mm -hmm. that to those listening, you're able to take some key takeaways, specifically the wonderful recipe mm -hmm. <laughs> that was put forth and make some change in your community communities, your organizations, uh, or your lives in general. Um, so it was a pleasure speaking with you. Um, thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next time.